Good morning, everybody. I think we, we can start. Uh, the first speaker today is Herre van der Zan. Herre is from TU Delft in, in the Netherlands, and he's a recognized expert in molecular electronics. Today, he will speak uh, about spintronics, but also in 2D materials. He's very well known in all these communities. The title of his talk today is Spin Signals from Single Molecule Quantum Devices. Herre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here, so uh, also today. And the title, when I gave it, it was without the word quantum. But nowadays, you always have to put quantum in your titles to, to promote your work a little bit better. So that's why I put it in here. And you will see that many of the things that I discuss will be indeed uh, quantum uh, effects. So the, the question that I want to address is, suppose that you have a single magnetic molecule, but it can also be a non-magnetic molecule, but in this talk I will concentrate on the magnetic molecules. How can you measure it? How can you measure the properties of this molecule and how can you measure the magnetic properties then of this molecule? And if you can do that, then you want also to use it in some kind of device eventually, so you would also like to have a way to control this magnetism. And if you look at the field, so this is the field of molecular electronics, the motiv motivation or the dream was always to have functional quantum devices at room temperature. So the room temperature is important here, right? because why do you use molecules? Well, energy scales in molecules are typically large, much larger than room, temp uh, than room temperature. So it gives you at least the possibility to think about devices made of a single molecule that operate at room temperature. And people have made electronic components like switches, diodes, transistors, and I will also show and start thinking about heat engines. Spin qubits, and this was one of the first proposals in, in this direction. And you see already 2007, so this was 15 years ago, and that people already thought about using molecules as, as qubits. So I will mo mostly focus here on molecular uh, spintronics, but you can also think about single molecule sensing if you have an electrochemical cell or something like that, and where you can contact a single molecule and then think about chemistry on that scale. So this is the dream. And I will tell you a little bit how and what you can do to achieve it. We're not there yet. We don't have devices that you can sell or something like that. If you look from a little bit of a distance, you can say there are two approaches to address a single molecule, STM and the planar devices that I will be discussing. If you look at the STM, and this is the, the field of surface science, you have a molecule on a surface. And it's very important to realize that this molecule interacts with this surface. It hybridizes. And so that means that the wave functions overlap. And it is also most likely distorted. And the molecule that you have on your surface may not have the same properties as the molecule in the gas phase. A little bit similar here. If I have a device where I have two electrodes and I put my molecule in between, you would like to have, at the ends at least, the molecule to hybridize with the electrodes. And because otherwise, the electrons that come in from the electrodes won't see the molecule. So there has to be some uh, hybridization. But different a bit from the STM, where the surface will planarize as much as possible the molecules, here we have a more 3D device, a more three-dimensional device. The molecules may be a little bit more, have the same shape at least, as in the gas phase. So that is a difference, and that means that if you do a measurement with a molecule in, in this platform, it may not give you the same results as here. And there are very few examples where people really try to make this connection and really try to, make a, uh, to measure a molecule here and to compare it with the results here. So that is still, I think, one of the, the things that we should do as a community uh, to better understand the limitations of these uh, both uh, platform techniques. Of course, the STM has a very, very big advantage that you can image the molecules and you know what you have. We cannot do that. On the other hand, STM is difficult to scale up. And you cannot scale up the technology and have many, many devices at the same time. Whereas here, we use the technologies that are uh, in, in clean rooms, fabrication technologies, and where in principle, uh, you can scale up your devices. <clears throat> There's one very important point that I want to make 
is that every molecule substrate electrode system yeah, is, can be a study on its own. And so if you put a molecule on a surface, it can take you a year to understand what's going on. And for us, it's sometimes the same. If we put a molecule in there, it takes a very long time. Uh, it can take a lot, of, a lot of time to understand what's going on. And why is that? Well, at the moment, we cannot predict with high accuracy the properties of these molecules when they interact with the surface, with the electrodes, and all these kinds of things. And that means that the status of the field is mainly still in the fundamental uh, studies. And we still need to understand better what the properties are of the, these different uh, molecules. So if we go to our system, so we have two electrodes, we have the molecule, and this is typically how people look at it. And you have a molecule that is fully stretched in the, in, the, in, in the junction and should behave then in an ideal way. And then people can do calculations. And this is typically how we compare our data with calculations. But in reality, life is not so simple. So if you have this molecule, the charge injection may not be at the end. It may just be somewhere at the, at the, at the middle of the, of the molecule. It could also be that there is one eh, more than one molecule in the junction. There can be different junction conformations. And there may also be interactions between molecules, like checking or something like that. All these kinds of things have been seen. And here we have some recent papers where we have really have tried to do benchmark studies to quantify these, these effects. We are on our way. We start to understand better how that works, but we are not there yet that we can really understand every detail of what happens in, in the junction. Because once again, we cannot look at it. We cannot, like with the STM, look at, oh, there is the junctions, there are the atoms. So one way of doing or dealing with that is that we do statistics <clears throat> and we do statistics without a data selection. And then what we uh, recently have been developing are machine learning uh, te techniques, algorithms, and to do in an unsupervised way, this data analysis. And I think that this is very important uh, for, the, for the future to keep on doing this. And also prep a proper reference measurements. And uh, they should be done more often also by other groups. But why do I like magnetic molecules? Well, magnetic molecules have unique features. And that means that if you have spurious effects, uh, that it's much easier to say, okay, these are from molecules that are not magnetic. So the magnetic molecules give you unique features uh, that you can look for. And that makes sometimes the interpretation of your data much, much more easy. So, oh, that was the wrong one. <clears throat> so then a little bit, how would, how would I like to have my molecule? Well, I want to have a molecule that has some kind of magnetic core, some magnetic functionality. But it's also known that you want to somehow not have this magnetic um, spin here directly with your electrode. So you want to have a little bit of a spacer. So this means uh, that you, you can have this spacer. It can be a conjugated part. It can be a non-conjugated part, depending how, uh, on how well you want to couple your spin to your electrode. And then you want at the end here, something that is mechanically connecting your molecule to your electrode. And typically we use silver um, here as the end group, but you can also use other uh, let's say elements uh, like nitrogen and, and all kinds of other anchoring groups and nowadays i think there are about 10 different anchoring groups and that are used by different uh, people in in the community <clears throat> one small comment here about the source and the drain this is typically made of of gold you can also do platinum and nowadays graphene superconductors and ferromagnetic electrodes are also there giving you a huge variety of, of possibilities to study these molecules. The, mo the molecules that we have been working on, I've divided them in three classes. We have spin crossover compounds, and I will show you an example of those. We have worked on radicals, organic, all organic radicals, but also other radicals. A little bit about nanographene, You've, you've seen a little bit uh, these molecules or molecules that look like this in the talk from Diego. Well, these molecules come from Diego. So I will show you a few uh, measurements on these ones. 
I will not go into the single molecule magnets. We have done a lot of work, especially let's say five to 10 years about this. It's a very complicated system with many energy levels and these kind of things. So I would like to concentrate more on these molecules. <coughs> you can also see here you have the anchoring groups here and here, here and here, but sometimes we don't use them. And then we just rely on direct injection into the pi system, for instance, of the molecule. And that sometimes works and sometimes not. Uh, and in this case, it, it worked remarkably well. And also in these iron fours, we have uh, iron four uh, single molecule magnets, and we had a very good experience with that. But we also have molecules with look almost the same, and we couldn't see anything. And so this is one of these aspects where we just don't understand yet why that is the case. So if we do the experiments, and the, these are the two platforms that I'm going to talk about, these are the mechanical brake junctions. So you really have a substrate that you can bend. You can bend it very slowly. And then you can, if there is a small, uh, let's say, uh, gold wire here, you can break that wire atom by atom. And at a certain point, you have one final point where there is a single atom between. And if you break it further, then you make a gap between the two electrodes. And then you can trap your molecule. We also make these systems where you do uh, electromigration. <clears throat> what is electromigration? You just send in a very high current through a very tiny wire, again, gold, and then you can just break that wire. But if you do that in a controlled way, you cannot end up with a, a gap here of about one to two nanometers. And once we have these systems, we can use a, a large variety of, of control parameters to learn as much as we can about the behavior of the molecule. So we can change the temperature. In this case here, you can change the electrode separation. So that means that you can put strain on it. So you have some kind of mechanical control over your molecule. You can also change bias voltage and gate voltage. And especially in these, uh, let's say platforms, if we change the gate voltage, you really make a transistor. So you can turn on and off the transport through your, your your, your molecule, I will show you how that works. We also have magnetic fields, and I told you already we can change the uh, electrode material if we would like to do so. And then there are many, many things you can do. And I can give, uh, let's say, 10 hours lectures or something like that on all the subjects that I've listed here, and I cannot do that. So I've selected a few. And if you go to this review paper, you can find much more details. Uh, this is really, I would say, on the level of students, at least intended to be so. So if you want to learn more about it, I highly uh, recommend uh, going to this paper. And if you have questions, I can, uh, I'm, I can always, I'm always there to answer. So what are some of the, the things that we, you can look at? Well. <clears throat> You can look at spin flip in elastic uh, uh, tunneling. We have seen that already, and I will show you how it works. What I will do also is to tell you a little bit of, about thermal electricity. Uh, so thermal transport, meaning that if you heat up one side of the junction, currents will flow. And um, what can we learn from these currents about the spin? That will be one of the subjects that I will address. You can do a lot of spectroscopy. Homolumo gaps, level spacings, you can talk about vibrations. And vibrations are very important in these systems. And we have seen that already in the talk from uh, Roberta. Vibrations are everywhere. You need that to understand the vibrations if you really want to understand these, these systems. And then something that is very cool is this quantum interference. Now you can have paths, right? you can have an electron that goes through your molecule. It can go through different paths and it can interfere. You can play with it. So a lot of things you can do about that. And what is nice about it, it just works at room temperature. And the effect is large. You can have changes in the conductance of an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude just by the interference of these uh, electron waves. But you see, it's not in blue, so I will not talk about it. But if you want to know more about it, you can just ask me. Condo physics, a little bit superconductivity. We've also seen that in the talk of Roberta. It's very interesting to have a superconducting electrode. You get a complex in magnetism that wants to have the spin in one direction. And then, of course, you have superconductors where you have the Cooper pairs. And that is going to, they are going to fight a bit. And this fighting is interesting, especially if the energy scales are about the same scale. And um, you get something that is called the Shiba states. And you can learn a lot, again, about your system. 
the kind of sensitivity spin switching. I will show you how spins can be switched and you just pull on them. Um, and then there are other, let's say, effects like spin blockade. Uh, we have heard about cis and the spin, um, the spin selectivity, chiral induced. Interaction with light is also very interesting, but especially these two subjects are really just beginning, let's say, on the single molecule level. And I would say that at the moment, there are not really convincing experiments yet uh, to that prove or that, that, that the field is on the level that you can control what is going on. Okay, so I will start first with um, something um, with the mechanical brake junctions. So you really have to go to a clean room and you make this gold here. You make a very tiny, let's say, uh, wire in the middle and then you suspend everything. And why do you suspend it? Well, if you then put it in this three uh, way bending system, uh, so you push here and push here, and you have this counter support, you can just, if you use a flexible substrate, you can just bend it. And where will it break? Well, the weakest point, and it is here. And that's why you want to have this suspended. You see, there is some scalability. We can easily make four of them. We can also make 20 of them uh, or 30 on the same uh, chip. That is not a problem. The problem is more to have all the wires uh, down. And so that's why we only have four of them. And already four of them is more than enough to measure for weeks. Uh, so uh, for us, this is um, good enough. Why do we this, do this? Well, we have a very high mechanical stability. We really have control, let's say, in 10 picometers over the distance between the two electrodes. Molecules then are deposited from the solution. And we can measure them at room temperature, at any temperature, basically up down to four Kelvin and characterize the molecule. So this is a bit about the fabrication, just to, to show you that is really a process that is used in, in let's say, more silicon-like uh, technology. So you have some resists, you have some, some substrate, you evaporate the, uh, the, the, the gold pads. And in this case, we also made an aluminum gate. And so we also have a third uh, electrode where we, so that we can use this as a, a transistor. And here you see this, this gate. Uh, so we break then the wire and we still have the gate intact so that we can gate transport through the molecule. You see here, there are quite a few steps. And so this is really a few steps on the top of each other, and meaning that the fabrication of such a device will take a few days. But once again, you can make many at the same time. So we make about 10, 20 or 30 of these substrates at the same time. And then this is what happens if we break the wire. And so we have here the gold atoms. Here we have a molecule. This is our fruit fly OPE3 molecule. And you break it. And you see that at the moment that it breaks, let's see here, and you see one gold atom, and then you separate the two electrodes. And then what you hope is that you have your molecule in between the two electrodes, bridging from one side to the other side. And then you can measure the conductance while stretching the molecule. Or stretching, let's say, or opening up the, the two electrodes. And this is then uh, what we see as the conductance as a function of displacement. And let's look at the black curve first. So we break the wire. You see that because gold is a little bit uh, like rubber. And if you cut it, then it just boop, opens up. And that is the jump uh, that you see here. And that is very nice of gold and uh, that you can always say, OK, if I see this jump, I know uh, that I rupture the, the, the wire. And then you see here this process where the molecule is in between the two electrodes and where we measure it. And you see that there are some fluctuations, but there is a, some kind of a plateau here and that then identifies the conductance of this molecule. You also see here that sometimes we don't track the molecule. And you see here some tunneling behavior, some exponential behavior. So this is just the bare tunneling directly from gold to gold. And this is a preferred situation because we don't want too many molecules in the junction, because then all the other effects that I just told you before about interactions between the molecules, they may be, become so important and that this then will not give you a very nice, let's say, clean signal. So this is what we call a 2D histogram where we have the conductance as the function of displacement. You can integrate over the distance um, coordinate. You get something that is, looks, looks like this, a 1D histogram. You see here very clearly what is called the 1G not peak. The 1G not peak is the quantum of conductance, G not. And the 1G not peak is the 
the, the point uh, where you just measure a single gold atom. The conductance of a single gold atom is exactly the quantum conductance. And you see that here very clearly as a peak because this situation where you have one atom in between the two electrodes is a more stable one than, than the others. We are interested in, for if you measure molecules, you're more interested in this region here below this conductance of a gold atom. And you see here that we have a peak at around 10 minus four. <clears throat> it's a broad peak. But this is the molecule, so the most probable conductance in this case of this molecule would be 10 minus 4. But you see there is some distribution. And that, these are all these different configurations of the molecule in the junction. So what we do typically is we take 10,000 of these traces and we use now these uh, algorithms, these, self, uh, these, these machine learning algorithms to do further analysis. So let me start with magnetic molecules. <clears throat> and the molecules that we are Considering are these, let's say, spin crossover like molecules. But these are special ones. So we have here the anchor groups, but here we put uh, some dipole moment. And the idea was that if you have a molecule with a dipole moment and you put a bias across the electrodes, that you can switch it just because of the dipole. And because the dipole, the electric field in the junction will produce a force. Yeah, and with that force, we were hoping to see uh, the switching of this molecule. And that is depicted here. So you have here a small, let's say, electric field. But then by increasing the electric field, and you will switch the molecule, you switch the spin state. And then the hope is, or the expectation was, that if you switch, you switch, you change the orbital configuration of the molecule, and that will lead to a change in conductance. Right? Because our probe is always the conductance of the molecule. So this is what we see. So we see IVs. So this is current as a function of, of bias voltage. And you see that we see here some hysteresis. So we see switching. We see switching here. We see switching here. But you see that in this case, <clears throat> we have the hysteresis. So we go forward. We go to this point. We go back here. And then we go here. And so it seems to be that we have two states, the states with a high conductance and a low conductance. We also have that here. A high conductance at zero bias, and then a lower conductance at high bias. But we also have the opposite here. And we have a low conductance state here, and then a high conductance state here. If we look, for instance, at this hysteresis, and we change our, let's say, electrode spacing, what we see is that we need a higher and higher bias voltage to change, uh, to make that transition, to see this, this jump. And that means that the electric field is important. And it happens at a particular electric field as expected for this switching mechanism. So what we have done here in this, this diagram is we have, uh, we, we list here all the switching events and the positions of them in bias. And what you see there is quite a large distribution. For us now, it's very difficult to assign what is the low or the high spin state. And we don't know because in principle, of course, the molecule should be in the low spin state if it's unstressed. But, it, but when you start the measurement, it could be that already the molecule is in, in a stressed state and is in the high spin state. You open up the junction, it suddenly <coughs> feels much better. It goes to the unstressed state, but it could also be the opposite, around, the other way around. So from these measurements, we can only conclude that there is spin switching because of the stretching but we cannot say whether the low spin state has the low conductance or whether the, and, and the high spin then the high conductance. Of course, we did the reference measurements. Right? So we have uh, iron low, uh, we have, uh, what is this iron two plus? No dipole, okay. So we did the uh, ruthenium. We have also done a bit, um, oh, sorry. We have done different, let's say side groups here where the dipole moment was not existing, where there was a small dipole moment, a high dipole moment, and the ruthenium where you don't expect this switching um, with a high dipole, we still see a little bit. But you do see that there's a correlation between, let's say, having a dipole moment and switching and having iron uh, in the core and have, or having a system where you don't expect the uh, ruthenium of the, 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 the switching. 
The next step in this whole thing is then we first made the one with the dipole and then we thought, okay, but it's, we can do it much easier. We can just use the fact that we are pulling on the molecule um, to switch. So what we now did is we took here the anchoring group so we don't have any dipoles. And what we are going, we, we put strong anchor groups and mechanical uh, that are very, uh, let's say strong mechanically. And now we're going to switch and see uh, whether we can just by inducing, by separating the electrodes, whether we now induce this switching. And this is what we see. So we have IV, oh, sorry, we have these breaking curves. Uh, so here again, we have the conductance as a function of displacement and the black curve that I showed you before for the other molecule. We, we break and then boom, suddenly the current increases. But look, this is almost one and a half orders of magnitude. So a factor of 40, 50 or something like that. And here's another junction, here is another junction. Again, and we have done all the uh, reference measurements with the ruthenium complex. You see that switching still occurs, but not as frequent and not as high. And here you see the distribution of all the different switching events that we have seen. And now if you make the comparison with, with the theoretical calculations, and we can conclude that the high spin state indeed has the higher conductance, as was already uh, shown in calculations uh, many years uh, ago by the chairman uh, who is sitting here. Okay, let's continue. Ah, no, that's not what I wanted. So here is this uh, calculation. Uh, here you see the high spin state, here the low spin state, and you see that if you stretch it by a few angstroms, then you get a crossover where now the high spin state is the lowest, uh, has the lowest energy, and here the low spin uh, is now the highest uh, energy. Calculations once again show then that this one here has the high conductance and this one the low conductance. Okay. Let's move on to a different system. And these are the molecules that uh, come from uh, Santiago de Compostela, from uh, Diego Peña, from his group at least. <clears throat> and these are molecules that are used as precursors to make uh, these ribbons. And we were just trying to set up all the equipment and Diego sent these molecules and we, to be honest, did not expect anything because there are no anchoring groups. So why would they be in the junction? One aspect I think what is very important to realize is that this is not a planar molecule. This has a 3D structures and these, these entities here, and that is also what, I, what we try to depict here, these are almost perpendicular to each other. And you need that so that these radical centers here, this, this is an open shell uh, molecule that these radical centers uh, don't collapse, that the, the open shell structure is stable. So it was an ideal molecule from that point of view for us uh, to try and start uh, working with, with these uh, systems. So we do now the mechanical brake junctions, and you see it here at six Kelvin, and we measure these two molecules. And what we see is that sometimes we see a peak. So this is the DIDV, so this is the differential conductance around zero bias. Sometimes we see a peak in both molecules, but in the two OS, so in the di-radical, we see also a, a, a dip-like structure. The peak, we understand. This is condo physics. We have seen that already a few times before. And it just tells you that you have somewhere a localized moment. For instance, a single spin. The inelastic here, this is an inelastic turning spectroscopy and I'll show you in a moment what is going on. But this tells you that you have interaction between spins. So let's have a look in a little bit more detail. So then we, I mean, with the break junctions, what you do, the, can do the statistics. So this is the 2OS. What we have done here is, and maybe I should go back. We, so you see here the full width half maximum is about 6.7 millivolts. And this is a, a measure for the condo temperature. It's related to the condo temperature. So it tells you something about the strength of this interaction of the, this, this magnetic impurity with the electrodes. So this is a strong interaction, by the way. This energy scale is large. But we have done that now for many, many devices, for different, uh, for different devices, for different breaking traces. You see here in total hundreds and hundreds of IVs. And what we see is that it's approximately around seven millivolts or something like that. And we have 
the, the most probable value for the, the condo temperature. You can also measure the 1OS. You see that there is also a huge, let's say, distribution here around this, uh, this value. But you also see here, and I don't show that, you also see here counts. And we believe that, that here and the SOMO gets into the window of transport. We can do further analysis. We can do the magnetic field dependence. You see here a splitting, which is characteristic for the condo uh, feature. It tells you that we are dealing with SS1 half condo. So, and we have a single spin. And you can also manipulate the condo temperature. And you see that here, that by stretching, and you can change the width of this, this peak. You can also change the height of the peak. And you can start playing with all the parameters here. It is strange though, that we have a diuretical that just shows you one half, eh? combo one half, and I will come back to that in a moment. Let me first uh, tell you a little bit about this inelastic tunneling spectroscopy. And if we talk about uh, transport in molecules, we always draw chemical potential diagrams. And so we have here uh, one lead, here the other lead. So these are the Fermi functions of these two. And here we have a molecule that has a discrete level with a certain, let's say, chemical potential. But suppose you have, let's say, a molecule where we have two spins then you know that one of the excited states is where you flip the spin. In this case, you could say, well, this is the ground state, the ferromagnetic coupling, but it could also be an anti-ferromagnetic coupling. But the excited state will be then either, if it, you start with a ferromagnetic one, and it will be then the anti-ferromagnetic one. And the energy scale will be the exchange energy. So why do we get a, a, a dip-like structure? Well, <clears throat> suppose that you have an electron here, this electron by Heisenberg can escape. Now, and then if there's a little bit of a bias, then it's more likely uh, that the electron that will fill this hole uh, comes from the left with respect uh, from the other side. But if there's a little bit more chance that it comes from here and it escapes again, then you have a little bit of transport in the right direction. Now, if the bias voltage is starts to be equal to this energy splitting or larger, you have another channel, a second channel for transport. Because now if this electron moves to the right, you can either move in here or you move in there. And if that happens, if you have another channel, the current increases. So the IV characteristic will look something like this. So current versus voltage. And exactly at this point where, you, where the bias voltage E over V is equal to this energy difference, and you expect to see an increase of the curve. So that is what is plot here as a DIDV, and typically in elastic tunneling spectroscopy, uh, people plot the second derivative, and then you see a peak. Now, this is a technology that is also a measurement method that is used a lot in STM uh, to really find, uh, let's say, smaller, small energy scales uh, spin excitations, vibrational modes, and, on, and all of that. So here you see this, this behavior in, a, in our case. And we can use now a magnetic field to see what happens uh, to the different states. And in this case, it's very clear that we have a triplet ground state. So a ferromagnetic coupling between the spins. And because you see that this one opens up, this one opens up, and you get an additional channel here, which is corresponding here. So here you see the two transitions that are available. And because there are spin selection rules. The two, uh, two transitions available is here from the MS minus one to zero, and here from the triplet state to the single state. We have done this for different samples. And what we see here, so you can then ex you can extract the exchange energy, and we find something very close to 10, 11, 12 millilinger volts. Well, first of all, this is a large value. If you take, uh, let's say, d electrons or whatever, you will find, or sorry, d orbitals, molecules with d orbitals, you find values that are much smaller. And this is one of the reasons why these magnetic systems are so interesting. Exchange energy, so the spins are spread out over large distances, so they can interact very well. Whereas for a d orbital, it's much more local, meaning that the exchange energies are small. So this is one of the first uh, conclusions. But it's also interesting is that we find 11 out of 13 the ferromagnetic ground state, meaning that there are also two where there's an anti-ferromagnetic ground state. And this is a little bit of a puzzle because STM measurements now in nanogunas always show the anti-ferromagnetic ground state. 
And that has to do with the fact that you planarize the molecule. It favors this antifire magnetic ground state. But if you do squid and ESR measurements, they also indicate predominantly this ferromagnetic ground state, but also a little bit of mixing with an antiferromagnetic ground state. And how to combine or connect the two experiments is still one of the puzzles and that we are trying to solve. But you see, that is a very powerful method uh, to get a lot of information about uh, the molecules. Okay, so what you can also do, you can stretch, and then I want to come back to this question, why do we see S is one half condo? What we believe is that we have a situation first like this, where the molecule is sitting like that, and we basically only talk to one spin. Now there's only transport through, through, from here to here through this single spin. You see very nicely the condo temperature. Now we start stretching, we stretch, 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 and then boom, suddenly uh, we see a inelastic turning spectrum uh, uh, signal very clearly. And we believe that we have a more uh, uh, configuration that looks like that. And so while stretching the molecule, and especially this molecule, because it has no anchoring groups, the molecule can adjust its position. And you beautifully see that here in the DIDV spectra. We can stretch it a little bit more, and you still, uh, I, well, I always, yeah, we go from here to here, you still see a little bit here of a condo. Well, it would be, well, it's a little bit semantics. We would call it non equilibrium effects. Uh, some people call it weak condo. There are different, different, uh, different uh, definitions for that. But you still see some reminiscence of this, this behavior here, then it's completely gone. And then certainly here, and that is something that we don't understand yet, and we see additional structure inside this inelastic turning gap. It's a very interesting system because we have many different condo features in our measurements that I will not show you here. And on its own, that could be years and years of work to understand what's, what's going on. I will not do that. Here I will continue and I want to say something about quantum thermal power. How much time do I have still? Oh, 20 minutes. Okay, so why are we interested in thermal power? Well, if you look here at the Mars rover, the Mars rover gets its energy through something that is called the Seebeck efficient. Uh, sorry, the Seebeck effect. And what does it mean? Well, you have somewhere a thermal gradient and this thermal gradient results in a current. Yeah. So beautiful huh? system to locally generate currents. So this whole idea about this, so using thermal gradients, then you can think about heat engines, uh, local cooling elements, uh, energy harvesters. So this is a big field. Uh, if you solve the issue or if you make something that is more efficient than what is available now, you can make a lot of money. We were not so much interested in that. We were much more interested on how does this thermoelectricity, how does this CWAC effect works if you really go to the quantum scale, to the nano scale? How does it work if you have a single um, molecule? And for that, we need a, a more complicated scheme of fabrication. I will come back uh, to that in a, in a minute. But first of all, I want to explain to you what we expect. So, we first take our, our chemical potential diagram again. So here we have one lead, here we have the other lead, and here we have our molecule, and the molecule is just a quantized level. And you see here that we have now put a bias voltage across. And so we have a difference here between this position here and the position here, and this here is my bias voltage, E over E. And what I'm going to do now, and this is crucial, I'm going to use the gate. So I, I'm going to use the fact that we make a transistor. So what you will see is that depending on the gate, and so I can put, for instance, the gate with the gate, my level here. And if the level is here, there's no current because there are occupied states here and occupied states here. There's no way that you can put an electron to the other side and to an unoccupied state. So the current should be zero. But now I'm going to change my gate voltage. And if I change my gate voltage, basically what I do is I'll push this up. So let's see what happens. You push it up, 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 boom. And there you see the current. And when this level passes, what we call the bias window. And you see then a current. So this is the off state and this is the on state. You can do a lot of calculations and things. This is called Colombo gate, Colombo gate here. And this is then your 
um, your, how do you say it, gate, Colomb peak, or whatever you would call it. Okay, so very important here, we have an electrical bias, and we have a change in the difference in, in, in voltage. Now, what we're going to do, we're not, we're not going to put in an electric field across, so no bias voltage, but we're going to heat one part. And what is this heating going to do? It's going to smear the Fermi function. Yeah. And now I'm going to do the same. I'm going to put my, it's not, yeah, there it is. So I'm going to put my level here. There's no current, but now you see there's a current because there are more states here than here. So the current is one way. Now the current is going the other way because there are more states here than here. And this means that you have whole transport here, you have electron transport here. You can then define the thermal voltage uh, where, you, where the voltage is equal to the temperature difference right, between the hot and the cold side. And here you see your Seebeck coefficients and uh, that determines how large this voltage is. You can also then define the thermal current, uh, which is then the conductance time, times this, this voltage. So keep this shape in mind. So once again, this is the gate voltage. This then would be the thermal current. Okay, device. So I told you we have a little bit more complicated device now because we need heating elements. And the heating elements in our case are uh, here in blue. So they're just underneath our electrodes. And, you, and that is a special feature of this device. You want to have the heating very local to your molecule. But if it's just underneath it, you also need other, let's say, layers to insulate, yeah, because electrically insulate the different layers on top of each other. So this is a device then with different layers, different, so you have to align everything. So this really has to be done in a clean room with the proper tools. But interestingly enough, this device was developed by a master student. This was his master thesis, and I think two or three years, no, three years ago, uh, he already showed here uh, this, this picture. Meaning that it takes about six, seven months or so to develop this, this technology. So special is here, eh, once again, that the heater is very close to your sample. We still use the gold and then uh, we use electromigration. Eh, so again, this pushing the very high current through to break it. And also what you see here is the gate eh, in purple. And so we need this gate because otherwise we can not eh, go through this, this, this point, and where you see this S, this, this shape, this characteristic shape, shape. Okay, so quite a few things to, 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 to keep track of when you make these devices, uh, but it is, a, a, it is possible to make them in, in many uh, on the chip. So this is on the chip, so we make many of them at the same time. So this is what we see. We see here the bias voltage, we have the great voltage here, and here in white, you see that there's no current. Here you see that there's a positive current, here's a negative current. So this is what I just told you. And by changing the gate voltage, and you see a peak arising. So this means that this is the on, sorry, this is the on off state of the transistor, and this is the on state of the transistor. We can also plot this as a differential conductance. And we like to do that because then you see these edges a little bit better. You see them here and here. You see a little bit more structure. You see here some kind of an excitation, which most likely is a vibration of the molecule. But what is um, the special thing here that we also measure the thermal current at the same time. We have some kind of a measurement scheme uh, where we can measure all these kinds of things at the same time. And uh, see, uh, look here, this is nanoamps. Uh, so this is uh, one, two, three, 0.4 picoamps. So the signals are not very large. Uh, but they can be measured. You see that the thermal current has some more structure. You see here some kind of red, so that is positive. Here you see the negative. Uh, so you can already see that this shape that I just uh, showed you it is present in these measurements. And I will come back to that in a minute. Okay. Landauer. If you see Landauer, that means that you are dealing with a theory where you see electrons as a wave. And these electrons as a wave go through your device in a coherent way. And you can do many calculations. And for instance, what you can do is you can calculate the conductance 
And you see here this quantum conductance, 2e squared over h. But you also see here the transmission. So basically what this Landauer formalism says is you have a wave of electrons, of a uh, wave of electrons that go through your device. Yeah. And what I have as the conductors at the end is how many of them are transmitted to the other side. Very powerful method uh, to describe our systems. But in this Landauer approach, you can also calculate the Seebeck coefficient. And the Seebeck coefficient is not proportional to this transmission, but to the derivative of this transmission to energy. And that has important points, and I think that uh, Nicolas will come back to that. And it means that the thermoelectric effects are large when the transmission features, uh, the transmission features are close to the Fermi energy on sharp. And also it means that homo-dominated transport gives you the positive thermal voltage and the, more, the negative. So in a way, you can use thermal electricity to see whether you have homo-dominated transport or limo transport. Many things you can play with, and, but I will not uh, go into that. I'm pretty sure you will see uh, more of it when uh, in the talk of Nicolas. What I wanted to just stress here is that a, there is a, a, a figure of merit, which is this ZT. And it's uh, given here. So you see here G times S squared. So this Z back coefficient tells you, uh, is, is, sorry, this S squared is proportional to this, this figure of merit. And why is this important? Well, if you want to have ZT larger than one, and, and this is this yeah, magical number, it has to be one or two to compete with the present technologies, you need a Seebeck coefficient of 150 microvolts per Kelvin. So what is it that we see? Well, let me in a few of time maybe directly go to there. What we see here is that if, so we have all these measurements, so we put them together and we, may, we plot here the Seebeck coefficient. We have a very high volume of, a value of 400 uh, microvolts per Kelvin. So this is a very efficient device from that point of view. You can also have the power factor and you can then get many, many more, uh, much more information out. But Nazario was happy for 15 minutes because there was no spin in the story. <laughs> so why do I tell you all of this? Because my, my title of the talk was, well, we want to learn something about spin. And that's now the point where I'm at. Because once again, here we have this conductance. Right? So you see this peak that I showed you in this animation. Here you have this S shape for the thermal current, also in the animation. But now if we have a closer look, you see that this S shape is a little bit asymmetric. Yeah? It's not, this is going to point one, and this is going to point 12. And, uh, what we, did, we first thought that this was a mistake. So what we did is we changed the, the difference of the temperature gradient across the junction. And here you see the ratio of these two values as a function of this difference. And it's very stable, it's very consistent. It's always around this 1.2. And why is this a little bit disturbing or was this disturbing for us? Because this Landauer theory, this, which is very successful in predicting all kinds of properties of these molecules does not predict it. The Landauer theory is here in orange, or yes, I think it's in orange. And you see, it's symmetric. So we are missing something. And what is it that we miss? We miss the fact that there is spin entropy. We miss the fact that one of the states is degenerate and the other one is not. And you have to take that into account. And if you do so, and you can very nicely reproduce the data. And we now know uh, that the state n, which was on the left side, was a doublet, and the state n plus one is a singlet. Just from this asymmetry. But that raises also a problem because we are working with this system, and this is a high spin system. And what we see is a change of the spin by one half. So what is happening? But this is, a problem that we have seen before, also with the molecules from Coronado's group, the POMs, if you add an electron to a molecule that has a metal center, where does the electron sit? Where does it want to be? 
And we have found many times that the molecule, or sorry, that the electron does not want to sit on the metal center, but it wants to sit on the ligands. And why is that? Well, typically you have a situation, an asymmetric situation, where these ligands are close to the uh, electrodes. And that means that if you put the electron there, it is stabilized. And there is some interaction with the electrons in, 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 in the electrode. And that makes it more likely uh, that the electrons are going to sit here instead of going to the metal atom. And then, of course, you have a system uh, where the change in, in, in spin is one half and not the change of your metal atom, not filling or your, your orbitals of your metal atom. For that, you need the asymmetric coupling. And if you look here in our calculations, you see that we have a very strong asymmetric coupling, almost electronic coupling. So the, the coupling to the left and to the right lead are different by a factor of 1000 in this case. Okay, I want to finish with three slides. Just to give you an example of um, a measurement that we did with this molecule, it's a radical as well. And we were measuring here, again, the differential conductance here, the thermal currents, and there's no sign of any spin. There's no condo feature, there's nothing here that will tell us, hey, this is, this is a magnetic molecule. But if we now look into this S, this, this, this shape again, so here we have the conductance, here we have the thermal currents, and we do it as a function of magnetic field. Well, what you see is that here at zero magnetic field, this positive peak is large, larger than the negative one. And then if we increase the magnetic field, they become the same size. And at high magnetic field at eight Tesla, they are reversed. Now this peak is larger than, than that one. We did again the fitting to all the, the, the theory that we have. And then what you can do is you can calculate the change in entropy as a function of magnetic field. And if you do that, you can just um, uh, come up with a scenario. And the scenario that we have is the following. <clears throat> we have here, S is one half, and the, 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 as we expected it. But here we have an S is, uh, S is uh, zero. And so we have an antiferromagnetic coupling. You know, so there's a triplet state there with an exchange energy of 1.7 millilactron volts. So where does this 1.7 millilactron com uh, milli volt comes from? Well, at this point here, where you have equal probability to be in one of, in this state or in that state, defines then, uh, because we work at a certain temperature, it gives you then this, this energy. So we have the triplet state here now as the uh, excited state and the, uh, the singlet state here as the ground state. So the antiferromagnetic coupling. So the story, I mean, what, what is, what, why is this now interesting? Is the fact that in conductance, we don't see anything. There's no way that we were able to find, let's say any magnetic signature of our molecule. But by measuring this thermal current, and we can assign very clearly that this is the SS1 half state and this is the SS0 state. And we can even uh, deduce, let's say, the, 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 the exchange coupling uh, between an antiferromagnetic ground state and the ferromagnetic ground state. Once again, the fact that we see this being 1.7 millivolt volts indicates that the other electron is not filling the shell. And so this is still an open shell system and where the other electron most likely is sitting somewhere here near one of the electrodes, I don't decide or that side. Okay, so with that, I, I conclude. Um, there are many things that I could show more, but I would like to refer you once again to this paper if you I want to go into more detail. We have also written an overview paper about more the technology side of it where we show how the different transistors work, how you fabricate them and all of that, which is in, in, in this paper. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Interesting. I'm wondering if in an STM configuration where you have the substrate and the molecule which are cold and the tip which are hot, you can actually see the same effects. Yeah, yes, you can. I mean, uh, Nicolas will show also many examples of that. Yeah. But you see, it can be very powerful. Huh? So. Uh, I would like to ask how to selectively insert only one single molecule near the junction breakpoint, because you have only one single molecule, of course, this it can slip between the junctions, it's clear, but you have, uh, have only one single molecule near this breaking point, so how it can be done. Yeah, that's um, a matter of statistics and luck a bit. So what we do is we adjust the molecular concentration such that we have a yield of about 10 percent and so of course if we put a lot of molecules a high concentration then there are a lot of molecules and everything everything becomes a mess i mean you can see it in the data you directly see it for instance you see i now show you this very nice crossing points clean nothing else is happening around it if you have another molecule it will also give you a crossing point and then they interact and it becomes a mess so we know from the measurements whether we have a single molecule or not and you have then to adjust the, um, the conditions in your experiment such uh, that this this happens so it means that we throw away a lot of this data where we have the feeling or where we almost certainly know that we have more than one uh, molecule okay i see thank you more questions One here. Uh, so you say that uh, for a mechanical break junction, you can know the configuration of the molecule deposited uh, between the two electrodes by changing the displacement, but when you are using like electromagnetic graded junction, how do you know which configuration of the molecule you have? We, I mean, we don't know basically. Okay. So we have maybe many different ways. So their statistics is much more difficult because every device takes time to make. And on a chip we typically make, I mean, it's limited by the number of wires in our cryostat. So we have 30 or something like that. So we can make 30 devices, so 10% yield. We have two junctions that work in one cool down. So we don't know, and we don't do much statistics there. We are already very happy if we have three, four molecules that show the same behavior. And that we're, when we're look, what we are looking for then is, for instance, a vibrational mode. If we see that in all the, the different junctions, and then we have at least some feeling that we're, what we're looking at is the same molecule in somewhat the same configuration but to be honest we just cannot tell okay thank you yeah any other question i have a, a question myself is this system with uh, the graphene the precursors of graphene uh, you say at the beginning you were you expect that uh, it was impossible to measure. Do you think that the interact well, in this case the difference in the magnetism? Do you think it's just a change in the conformation in interaction with the surface in the STM and with electrodes in your case, or also when the people are measuring this in the squid? It's just a change in the conformation of the of the different part of the molecules. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what you basically have is two spins. They <laughs> talk to each other with a system where I mean. It's, it's really yeah. almost like that. And so if you have torsions here, then the, 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 the interaction between these spins or the overlap of the wave functions will be yeah, different. If the central part is more or less flat, is you yeah. will have a strong interaction. And, uh, yeah, and the, that is very sensitive then to this torsion angle. So I can understand from that point of view that you can go, uh, that large changes are possible. And of course, if you have the molecule and you open it up and it may not be relaxed, and there may be some tension in the molecule, and then uh, 
it could, but what, it's also what we see uh, that sometimes we have the uh, antiferromagnetic ground. Yeah, because it, it seems that the, the 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 localization of the of the radical in the external in the external part of the molecule is quite big because the the yeah. condo is quite a strong and the interaction with the electrodes is. Yeah. Is so this this molecule in particular has a very large condo temperature. Yeah. We have many other radicals, and typically they are smaller. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Nathario. Thank you, Hero, for your presentation. Regarding the seabed coefficient, uh, I, I, I have the feeling that most of, in most cases is uh, we are playing a try a try and uh, uh, um, try and error. And um, would you think that uh, could be possible to to design in a rational manner an organic molecule in order to improve these values for organic molecules? I mean. Mm -hmm. You want an honest answer? Sorry? Do you want an honest answer? No, I, I would say an abstract of your, of your, of your answer. Yeah. Nicolas will give the answer. No, no, no. But uh, I, will, I will tell you, I mean, I think what the most important thing here is that if you look at this equation, yeah. I mean, you want to have the derivative of your transmission very much. So if I take an organic molecule and put it between electrodes, yeah, what is going to happen to, to the level of your molecule, it wants to sit in between the homolumo gap. And typically in that region, the transmission is flat, meaning that the seabed coefficient will be small. So you have to do something special to make this seabed coefficient then very large. So for instance, you can try to put a quantum interference feature at that energy. People also thought, okay, let's put radicals there because that also gives rise to features that are sharp, but the radical still, I mean, it, you don't have the radical, the SOMO very close, typically very close to your Fermi energy. It wants to be a little bit further away. It doesn't want to be charged all the time, the molecule. And that I think is the problem. Here we don't have that problem because with the gate, and we can go through this transmission. We can go, we have a large peak and we can just go through it. And that is the, the advantage of having the gate because then you can make the Z-back coefficient very large. Okay. But this is a general rule. There could be exceptions of that. Huh? And, and those would be very important to find them. Any further question? If not, we can thank her again and then